This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 491, recorded on April 27th, 2018. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. Cloudy. Misty. And looking across the river, as I do, you can't see the view that I see. 11 Celsius. Looking at Fort Lee, New Jersey. It was raining this morning. It was raining this morning, but it's now, it looks like some impressionistic view of the uh, built environment. I can't it's, see it's, a thing from here. It's quite interesting. I like well, it. Like also it. joining me from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. Hey, Alan. Welcome back. Good. To, yeah. Good to be back. It's only two weeks, but it seems like ages. <laughs> it's It does. Yeah. Like so much has happened. And it is, um, uh, it's raining here. It's yeah. uh, cloudy and rainy and um, uh, yeah, that's pretty much, pretty much encompasses it. Yeah. <laughs> From southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. <laughs> right. Hey, Kathy. <laughs> What's it's, up? <laughs> it's 62 degrees. Yeah, wait a minute. Wait, What's the temperature? <laughs> 17 degrees Celsius. Oh, and I have a good image to send you from yesterday. I'll put that in the show notes momentarily when it was 61 and 16. Is mm, it cloudy neat. or sunny? That's cool. 61 uh, and 16. It's kind of uh, mostly cloudy with little blue tinges to it. Mm, a hint. Yes. 61 and 16. That's good. Yeah. Is that the only one that does that? No. 28 and 82. 28 and 82. Uh-huh. 20, 20 and 68. No. Well, 20 <laughs> Celsius is 68 Fahrenheit. Oh, yeah. Okay. But, but that's not if you're doing palindromic. palindromic numbers. No, but, but you're saying that 16 Celsius is 61 Fahrenheit. Right. Correct. That's amazing. And 28 Celsius is 82. 82 Fahrenheit. And, no, and any others? Or is that it? No, forty three minus forty three is minus forty three, or close enough. <laughs> That's cold enough. Forty three is what's the answer? Forty two. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Joining us from Austin, Texas. Speaking of forty two, Rich Condon. <laughs> hey, how you doing? <laughs> you wish. <laughs> uh, look, hey, wait a minute. I look wish to just walk in. Say hi. Hey, Harper. Hi. Hey. Hello, Harper. Oh, hello, Harper. <laughs> hi. She can't. She can't hear you because she just walked in. She doesn't have a headset on. Oh. Okay. Well, I, I remembered her name this time. Third, yeah, you did. You did a good job. Third time. Uh, okay, so we got, um, bye, Harper. We got uh, 76 degrees, which is 24C, and, like, it's glorious. You know, good it for turns you. out good for that you. Texas, Texas actually has, like, seasons. Yeah. Uh, and this is, uh, I guess, kind of the tail end of spring. I'm just learning about this. But we just had a whole bunch of yard work done, and it's just gorgeous, and it's a beautiful day. And there's been a whole string of these days, and there's arts <laughs> festivals this weekend, and it's just absolutely wonderful. It's with or without barbecue. Uh, I I could I could add in barbecue. That's not high on my pick list. Okay, but um, you know, I just noticed that uh, Kathy's Google <clears throat> Doc image is is sweet. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, it's a plate of Christmas cookies. The, the viral <laughs> cookies, right? A lot of cookies. I see a or Linz, Christmas cookies, Linzer yeah. tort in there, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. My favorite. Yeah. What's in the circular ones? Black and white with circles, right? Oh. Uh, Swirls, I maybe? See. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> no problem. I'll tell you about ASM special opportunity for our podcast listeners. Get $50 off registration for Microbe 2018, June 7 to 11 in Atlanta using the promo code ASMPOD. ASM Microbe 2018 connects scientists with their science and showcases the best microbial sciences in the world. Delve into your scientific niche in eight different tracks. I hope you'll know how to swim if you're going to dive into your niche. Exactly. (laughs) By the way, 7-Eleven is uh, lucky numbers. Don't miss this opportunity. (laughs) Visit asm.org slash microbe. That's asm.org slash microbe. And use the promo code ASMPOD for $50 off registration. See you in Atlanta. Hey, Kathy, is it going to be a big ASV this year? 
it is going to be a big ASV. There's more abstracts than at least in the four years when I was involved as program chair and vice chair, over a thousand mm-hmm. abstracts. Holy God. And so uh, what that means is that so far, one of the hotels with room blocks, the Holiday Inn, um, has sold out. But the two that are on campus and a third one near campus still have rooms. There's also on campus dorm housing that's available. And then there's other hotels that uh, are not part of the room block uh, and are farther out. So uh, the point is, if you want housing, you might want to go ahead and uh, sign up for that now. And early bird registration ends midnight on Saturday, May 19th, mm. which is remarkably close. Oh. <laughs> mm-hmm. so it is. The, the, the rates go up after that. So sign up now. You think Maryland's a popular campus? Well, I think it's there's that, DC. plus there's all the D.C., NIH, right. FDA, mm-hmm. USDA, Berries, et cetera. Hopkins, yeah. you got yeah. a bunch of Three stuff. airports. You got it. You know, so, there's, yeah. there's actually the oldest operating airport in the world really? is at College Park. Really? Hmm. Yes. Yes, the Wright brothers taught Holy the cow. very first military pilots how to fly hmm. at that field. Uh, unfortunately, now it's part of this absurd security zone, so you have to like get fingerprinted and cavity checked and and security cleared cavity through a special checked. process in order to <laughs> Sounds fly. like a dental procedure. Yeah, I, it's <laughs> very very annoying. I mean, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> the microbiology department at the Icon School of Medicine is seeking faculty candidates interested in strengthening their program in virus host interactions. Applicants must hold a PhD and or MD, have postdoctoral experience, and be interested in creating a virus-related research group that will complement the pre-existing departmental program. Recruitment of individuals or couples at the level of assistant, associate, or full professor will be considered. More information can be found at icon.mssm.edu. Should you wish to apply, please send your CV and a brief description of your research plan to nycvirology at gmail.com, or you can contact Ben Tenover directly. The Viruses and Cells Gordon Research Conference needs your financial support. NIH and foundation support have declined dramatically in recent years. The organizers of the 2019 meeting, Julie Pfeiffer and Britt Glausinger, need $70,000 to support partial registration and travel costs for 32 speakers, 18 discussion leaders, and selected students and postdocs. Donating is easy. It takes less than a minute. Go to the secure donation site, which we we will put in the show notes, and provide contact information, how much you'd like to donate, and how it can be used. And for how it can be used, say, for Dixon's vertical farm. No, no, just kidding. Exactly. No, don't do Your that. donations are tax deductible, and you will be acknowledged as a friend of TWIV on the conference materials. Actually, maybe we should acknowledge you as an enemy of TWIV. <laughs> if you be, like. Just to be funny. Not you, Dixon. No, no, not me. No. You could you could identify people as uh, unindicted co-conspirators. Could. That sounds familiar. Yes. Is that from Watergate? That's what... Uh, a widely used legal term. Unindicted co-conspirators. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Persons of interest. It's it's a term that may come up yet again. <laughs> I hope so. I hope oh, it yeah. does. All right. Now let's do some uh, hardcore science. We'll delve deep into our niche. with Full a, frontal science. With a life jacket. Because when you dive into niches, you do need life jackets, right? You do. you do. The first is an article published in Nature, which I believe was a pick of Dixon's a few weeks ago. The Evolutionary History of Vertebrate RNA Viruses. We have four co Four co-first first authors. Yes. Authors. Mang Shi, Shan Dan Lin, Xiao Chen, and Jun Hua Chen. Shen. And my Mandarin is really bad, I know. <laughs> but there you go. And the last author is Yang Zhen Zhang. And they come from many places throughout China, the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention in Beijing, mm. Fudan University, the University of Sydney, that's in Australia. Yes. Uh, Wanzhou Center for Disease Control and Prevention, South China Agricultural University, mm-hmm. the Wuhan Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and the Yang Chen Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Mm-hmm. We have... The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention here in Atlanta, 
Do we have any other centers for disease control and prevention? It's in Europe. I think Europe. No, in the U.S. Yeah. No, not in the U.S. In the U.S. No, the, in the U.S. There's the the center for centers for disease control and prevention in Atlanta. Um, other countries around the world have started to copy this concept. That's right. uh, the European CDC was started um, not that long ago. I was a science journalist at the time it was started. Um, Why does China that, have so many? Because they're big. I yeah, it's a big country well, with a lot of people, it's and I guess they SARS. And I guess they decided to um, uh, to diversify it by by putting one in each. I'm I'm going to guess that it's one in each province. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, so that's probably what these are. It's a cool paper. Uh, uh, I noticed mention- that. I just want to comment on the authorship. Yes, sir. That, uh, Edward Edward C. Holmes <laughs> shows up here. Yeah, he's in there. He's the Australian uh, dude. Uh, uh, but and- he also has affiliations with two of the Chinese institutes. Yeah. It's amazing. And he's not too long ago. He was at Penn State. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He went back. Didn't like Penn State, where he got a better offer. But he's originally from Australia, right? Right. And uh, this is a cool paper because, as you could tell from the title, it looks at the evolutionary history of vertebrate RNA viruses. Is that what it does? <laughs> Big time. Apparently, we've had a sampling bias towards RNA viruses of birds and mammals. Hmm, let's see. Because that's what's easy to get. Easy to catch them. And we have a lot of people around. And so... Got a bunch of mammals and birds kicking around in labs and on farms. There's a low-hanging virus. If you look at the evolutionary history of vertebrates, of course, there are many more vertebrates than birds and mammals. So they said we should fill it in because, in particular, birds and mammals are the newest members, right? They're older ones. Basal to all us. So... If you could find viruses in them, maybe you get some ideas about how far back viruses go. So that was the the purpose of this. It's very cool. And they went out and sampled 186 host species. I guess they caught them in some way. And uh, that just covers the whole range throughout the chordata, the ones with uh, with spinal cords. Uh, notochords. 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 I never note a chord that I didn't like. There you go. Right. <laughs> these I in- played the song for you, but I don't note a chord. Oh, nice. notochords. Do, I, fo- do, do to, I have a notochord? Sense. You have a backbone and a, a spinal yeah. column. It's, Are you saying I'm spineless? No, I don't. No, you're spine. I didn't use that word. Sorry. <laughs> um, Sorry. So uh, what were you going to say? 186 How? species. I don't know that they caught all of them themselves. A lot of these are probably available. That's um, right various sources, but to put another number on it, which just blew me away, they generated 806 billion bases. That's a lot. (laughs) I read that, I thought. The one thing that I liked. All the RNA in all these things, this is, it's no wonder this has four first authors. This is a boatload of work. You know, sandwich in here, they they even sampled Sicilians. Speaking of (laughs) both. I'm just, it's a joke. It's, It's a kind of amphibian. (laughs) <laughs> Sicilian. Really? Speaking of boats. Speaking Solarian. of boats. I thought that was Silurian. Uh, <laughs> they did get some of their marine samples from uh, frozen from ships returning at the dock or purchased ah. alive from local fishermen. Okay. Uh, the freshwater fish samples they captured alive using fishing rods or nets. Uh, the reptile and amphibian samples were caught by field biologists from a wide range of geographic locations. Right. And they also got some samples, the lungfish samples from Nigeria hmm. and Chile, Nigeria and Chile. Everything else was collected in China. I'm sure. So this was a literal fishing expedition. <laughs> mm-hmm. Literally, that's right. Well, they took these, and then, R- they had. Oh, wait a minute! It's it was a littoral. <laughs> a littoral. <laughs> they had fishing. they had animals from Leptocardi lancelets. Yes, lancelets, which are. They're not vertebrates. They are invertebrates, but they're very close, right? Chordates. They're, right. Chord, they're all chordates, but they're... They're also known They're all as, lower, lower chordates. They're also known as amphioxy in plural or amphiox in singular. Lower. lower is a, not a nice Which I had not say. thought about since zoology class in college. <laughs> exactly. Amphioxus. Oh, my gosh. Amphioxus. I didn't think this was going to be on the test. Exactly. Jawless fish, cartilaginous fish, right. ray-finned fish. Right. Lungfish, Dixon. Which are your favorite to catch? Oh well, I like the cyprin. Uh, I like the um, Rayfin. No, no, I like the salmonids. Frogs, amphibia, frog salamanders, and Sicilians. <laughs> Sicilians, <laughs> reptiles, <laughs> snakes, lizards, 
and turtles. And the cool thing is they got RNA from gut, liver, and lung or gill of all the animals so they could see if they found anything, if it was in more than one tissue, implying a systemic infection, right? So as Alan said, 806 billion bases. <laughs> and then they had to search through and find the viruses, throw out the cellular sequences. Right. They ended up uh, focusing on the vertebrates. And this is RNA, so the cellular sequences are going to be huge quantities of RNA. Did they run a risk of of sequencing RNA viruses that infect bacteria? And they talk about that. Yeah. I forgot what they said. Uh-huh. They basically said they uh, screened those out, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they're, they're looking, in order to screen these data, they're looking for similarities to known viruses. Yeah. Right. Which, as is pointed out in this accompanying article, that is a limitation. Uh, uh, it puts it, yeah, puts a puts a certain bias on this. But right. I mean, yeah, you could find even more probably if you didn't do. They still have the raw so data, right? So what you could do would be to assemble contigs, right, and then use that instead of homology, and maybe you'd get more. But hmm. anyway, and a quarter of these viruses were uh, found in multiple tissues from the same individual, so they they may have caused systemic infections. Now they identified two hundred and fourteen. New viruses. Wow. And that 196, they say, are vertebrate specific. And they say that this shows that RNA viruses are present in more numbers and diversity in vertebrates other than birds and mammals. Right. Right. So all you had to do is look. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing is, every kind of virus known to infect mammals or birds is also present in amphibians, reptiles, or fish. Right. And they've got some new viruses in places where they never found them before. Uh, I thought a couple of things that were interesting, they found members of the arena viruses, filoviruses, and hantaviruses in ray-finned fish. Yes. Pretty old, right? Yeah. Well, ray-finned fish are just the fish that have spiny... Yeah, but the on, the, on the phylogenetic the tree, they're rather they're rather far back. Right? Teleos go pretty far back. Yeah, so that yeah. means the viruses, are, these viruses that are filoviruses, for example, they go way back. It's the first evidence. Well, I guess there were some integrations that are old too. Um, yeah, and, so we we think of those as predominantly mammalian viruses, but yeah, they're not. They've obviously been around for quite some time. Well, the yeah. the oldest the oldest taxon they're talking about is. Jawless fish, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. And you can find hantaviruses, influenza viruses, huh. Khaleesi viruses, uh, astroviruses, uh, heapy uh, viruses. I think that's about it. But a lot of a lot of these uh, things that we're familiar with now, of course, I mean they 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 align with those virus families. Okay, they're going to be right. different. So I thought it was cool. They found lots of new picornaviruses, lots of new mm-hmm. picornaviruses. Lots of, yes. So, you know, no problem extincting poliovirus. We can find another one to work on. <laughs> uh, there were um, influenza viruses in jawless fish <laughs> and the Asiatic toad and the spiny eel. <laughs> well. And the tropisms for, for many of these viruses were similar to the mammalian counterparts. That's cool. The phylogeny yeah. of the virus. Yeah, often- so they, they in fact, they appear to be found in similar tissues. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true as well. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, um, just for, for, for Caleb at, at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. got it. <laughs> the, uh, if you look at the phylogeny of the host, it mirrors that of the virus over long periods. So viruses of fish, are basal to viruses and amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, because the animals themselves are basal to, which means they have common ancestors. I so think it that's looks cool. like these co-evolved, and you, you've got these viruses just moving along with us through <laughs> hundreds of millions of years of evolution. So if, you find, if you find here the oldest, um, that you said they were the, uh, the jawless f- f- fish, right? Yeah, they, and they go back more than 500 million they, years. If they have an influenza virus and we have an influenza virus, that's a that's a lineage, right? At least. It may have been gone even before the right. uh, jawless. And they don't have lungs, right? They have gills. Right. Yeah. It's cool. So that's, they don't even have jaws. 
<laughs> they don't even have jaws. <laughs> and they said, despite this this uh, clear uh, mirroring of phylogenetic history, you can see multiple host jumps over the years. Oh. Uh, so, for example, they say the influenza virus they found in ray-finned fish. When I say that, I, I think of a fish with sunglasses on. For some reason. <laughs> <laughs> it was the closest relative of mammalian influenza B virus. Amazing. So it switched hosts at some point, right, from a fish to a mammal. How did that happen? Did a mammal eat a fish? Maybe a seal ate a fish, and then the seal came on land and it got eaten by a lion. You know, you think of all these chains of infection. It's cool. I you like do. that. You do. I think that's pretty neat. So there's a, a cool graph that I liked in the uh, accompanying news and views by Mark Zeller and Christian Anderson that listeners might want to take a look at that really kind of simplified uh, the tracking of the evolution a little bit. But I wanted to comment on the fact that there's a major group of viruses, RNA viruses, that they didn't turn up. Did anybody else notice this one? Hmm. The rhabdoviridae. Oh. The muscle which infecting? Which are in plants, <laughs> including maize and lettuce, and they're in invertebrates and vertebrates, and I would have thought that mm, they would they have should be there. Yeah. turned up some. I, I found that huh. really strange. I wonder if it's a sampling error. <laughs> well, and that's something <laughs> that the the perspective mentions in terms of sampling, um, that there are like 50,000 vertebrate species, and it is a very impressive accomplishment that these folks sampled 186 of them, but that's still small, a still very, finished. very small percentage of the total. Yeah, there's more more to be done. Oh, yeah. because, yeah. Sure. And because, as we mentioned, because this is a, a, um, a homology-based search, there's there are going to be other viruses out there. So it may be that they didn't find the rhabdoviruses because their algorithm wasn't loose enough to catch the ones that were there. I don't know. Mm. Another right. thing I, I thought was cool was that they saw, when, the, when they annotated the genomes, right, you can see different architectures from what we already right. knew about, like a lot of variation in, in the length of genomes, their organization of the open reading frames, uh, the order of the Structural versus non-structural protein open reading frames, the number of glycoproteins, and one interesting one is change in segment number. So some of these older arena viruses have three instead of two RNAs, which we see today. And so, you know, at some point there must have been a reduction in segment number. And, you know, as we find more, you can get more information on this, which yeah. I think is really cool. I find it really remarkable that there's as much conservation as there is. It is. You know, any, over 500 million years. 500 million years. That's it. Were exactly. any paradigms shattered by this paper? Paradigms? Yeah. No, I don't think so. Okay. Well, I don't know. It depends on how you define a, a paradigm. Um, 20 cents. A widely held <laughs> 20 cents. A pair of dimes. Uh, no, that's a pair of docks. The, 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 so, yeah. So, no, no, no. I get, I get what you're saying that the yeah, did you get surprises sort of paradigm of, of some of these virus families that we've traditionally associated with mammals, like the, uh, the, the filoviruses and the hantaviruses. Um, now this, I think pretty clearly demonstrates that these have been around for a much, much longer time and are much, probably much more widely spread than we realized. So well, uh, uh, consistent with that, uh, one of the, in this comment that, Vincent picked out that covers this article. Uh, the thing that really st caught my eye was this one sentence, RNA viruses are probably older than the last common ancestor of life on Earth. Mm, for sure. Right? Now, this we've talked about before. If you do you know, sort of the global extra extrapolation on evolutionary history of RNA viruses, they prop they you know, one idea is that they predate cellular life. Right. Go back to the RNA world. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're clearly older, but um, this is you know five hundred million years. It's not bad. But we did a paper. Uh, I don't remember if it was the paper or the perspective mentioned it framed that as um, uh, studying viral evolution across geological time scales. Yeah, that's cool. Which I think really put it in perspective. Geological yeah. time I mean, scale. That, that's at about the time that the oxygen level in the atmosphere reached a tolerable limit for uh, when five hundred million years ago for mm -hmm. animals. Yeah. Be sure. Yeah. But is that why life arose first in the seas? You bet. 
because there was a tolerable, tolerable oxygen level. Yeah. Right. But of course, it was the increase that caused the initial explosion in species. Right? Yeah, indeed. Mm. It allowed land plants. Once land plants were there, the rest was history, as they would say. Yeah. And these, these lineages of viruses <laughs> that have persisted through 500 million years in recognizable forms, um, that includes a couple of huge extinction events. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, that goes through the, oh, right. the extinction of the dinosaurs, but even further back than that, it goes through the, um, um, I think, the end Permian extinction, the, the big one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry. So like 90 percent of life on Earth was wiped out and exactly. the viruses are still here. Although they may have changed, right? They may have, but so. we can still track. They're still similar enough that we can track them back this way, which is pretty cool. Well, there are probably a lot that were extincted as well, right? Yes. That we'll never see. Does this say something about the, um, the robustness of cellular biology? I mean, what's, what's sure. if you went back in history yeah. with regards to the cell biology aspect, forget virus infection cells, just normal cells, and you go back far, 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 how far do you go back before you start losing all the um, the complex protein synthesis mechanisms? And the machinery that these machineries. viruses need to exactly, carry exactly. out their life cycle. Very right. precisely. Long time. Yeah, long it's, time. It, it the tells cy- us the cyanobacteria emerged uh, billions of years ago. They did. Right. So they had the, the basic machinery. They were there for they, 2 billion know. years without anybody else. Yeah. They That's got incredible. Bo- they got bored. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this idea about extinction is interesting because, as we've already discussed, the a uh, limitation of the study is that it's based on similarities to <laughs> viruses that, that currently right. exist. Yeah. Okay? So if you can somehow open that up sure, sure. to discover viruses that, you know, are not around now. I don't know quite how you how you structure this, but if you could do that, um, you might discover viruses that were here and are no more. Well, right? that would be interesting. People do have algorithms for discovering long contigs right. that are not genomic do, yeah. and something else, right? And then you can right. start to see. Yeah. And it yeah. takes a long time. So I think they took the the easy part here, not to say that it was easy, but they took the low hanging fruit. Not mm-hmm. to say that it was low hanging fruit, but something. You know what I mean. And now yeah, they, we'll see they, future they papers. They to get a paper out this century, and so they. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's right. That's right. They, it, they did the thing that was that was most straightforward with this sure. sample set, but they've still got eight hundred and six billion bases stored on our drives. Yeah, that's and right. Can go back to exactly. That. Has anybody ever pulled a viral sequence out of amber? A viral sequence? Not that I know of. Yeah, out of an insect or a plant no, no. that's embedded in amber? No. But some things have been pulled out of amber, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes? That's true. Uh, but not viruses, no. Okay. Not that or, I know. Or, but I not, don't mean the but, virus, but, but part, parts of viruses. But maybe they have and they didn't recognize it, right? Exactly. Sequences in amber. Going to get all kinds of weird results. I'm yeah, sure. Jurassic Park and all that. Yeah, right. Uh, it does, but, uh, there's a lot of stuff there. I don't have time, right. but I wanted to ask one question of our learned crew here. <laughs> so, you know, the lancelets are very old, right? They are. They're basal to everything else that is looked at in this study. So we say. Aha. You don't believe it? <laughs> no. How would you know? Because that doesn't leave a fossil record uh, that's well, there is. abundant. There is, a, there is a fossil record of most no, but of this stuff. Who knows? What, we didn't think amphi- the uh, coelacanth was around either, but it is. So that's a Well, throw. why is it still around? Yeah, that's the point. Why, that's what I want to know. Well, I think because maybe their habitat is so um, so boring. Specialized <laughs> niches that no one else They live down in the mud. No one else wants to go there. Yeah, exactly yeah, right. Exactly coelacanths right. are a very, very deep water fish. They are. And apparently they taste horrible. <laughs> and so they're still around because nobody's fishing for them. Right. But that's, you know, only a matter of time before we dredge them all up in bottom trawls and eventually they will be gone. But right. uh, they're, they're still around because they can be. By the way, there's yes. an endogenous, foamy-like viral element in the coelacanth genome. Ha! <laughs> they were infected by foamy retroviruses. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Isn't that great? Yes. But I'd like to know what other viruses they have. Huh. So that's just the genome. But if you got a coelacanth and you took its tissues out and did this, would you find other, yeah. you know, non-endogenous viruses? So, right. Dixon, the next time you catch a coelacanth, can you keep it <laughs> yes. and we'll, don't throw it back? No, I, I promise. I, I don't think fly fishing would be the right way to go. <laughs> no, not not in the least. 
Anything else on lancelets before? Yes. I wanted to comment on the fact that I had ringing in my head a song about Amphioxus. Uh (laughs) And so I Googled that. And maybe this is the one that I had, but this one is to the tune of uh, It's a Long, Long Way uh, to Tipperary. And so you get lots of hits. I didn't look at any of the YouTube ones, but (laughs) the link that I put in the show notes uh, describes the evolution of the song and the lyrics. And also, if you go far enough down, describes maybe the evolution of people um, and some uh-huh. uh, uh, discrepancies or mm. uh, interesting things about that. So if you have ever heard of that song, so it's connected to the Marine Bio Labs uh, at Woods Hole and <laughs> also potentially Cold Spring Harbor Labs, although it may have originated at the MBL. Anyway, uh-huh. just a little uh, cultural thing you might want to check out. Cool. Now we have a paper on another RNA virus, which is entitled, it's from Science Magazine, it's entitled Tropism for Tuft Cells Determines Immune Promotion of Norovirus Pathogenesis. And this was handed to me the other day by Dixon. It was. Who ripped it out of his issue and said, we should do this. That's right. Wait, so Dixon had a pick of the week and a suggestion for the show that were both virology papers? And a snippet. Yeah. Is, is wow. that, is that, that's right. Uh, no, that's it's, we are converting him slowly. I'm I'm going viral. <laughs> this is from multiple universities: Washington University, University of Illinois at Chicago, Harvard School of Public Health, New York University, and Genentech. The first author, as far as I can tell, it's a single first author. It used to be a single. Craig Weiland, and it's from the laboratory of Herbert W. Virgin, also known as Skip. 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 And there are 21 other authors. Yes. <laughs> are any of them from Tufts? <laughs> one of them, unfortunately, no. I one, of them is, one of them is Paul Allen. Is, uh, really? <laughs> the owner of the what Portland Trailblazers? <laughs> well, Paul M. Allen is from Washington University, but it's not him. That's a common name, I think. Yeah. Anyway, this is about neuroviruses, of course, which we like here on we do. Twitter. We do. We speak quite often about them speak and we uh, we know that they are causative agents of acute viral gastroenteritis listen to this 700 million infections every year that's incredible 200 200,000 200, deaths. deaths and that's from people who lose fluids and that's don't have so, them replaced it's almost like cholera should not yeah. be dying from it no think think a cruise ship cruise ship that's right. If you're having if you're having trouble placing this, yeah, yeah. but it's not the two hundred thousand deaths are not on cruise ships. No, no. <laughs> those are those are people in settings Little in kids. Poor countries right. where they can't get yeah. any right. kind of hydration and yeah, yeah. Now, right at the beginning of this article, they say it is unknown what cell types mediate transmission and in some individuals chronic infection. So, we on TWIV have previously talked about the, the really cool observation that these viruses infect. B cells and require yes. bacterial components, and it's not mentioned. Why there, aren't B cells mentioned? It seems like this is a running thing in the noro field. People not citing each other's work. Oh, we had that once before, where the yeah, yeah, yeah I remember that. <laughs> anyway, yeah, like we've got a unique so the, so mouse the, model the, that nobody's ever done a mouse model before, and we had just talked about a mouse model for noro infection. And now mm-hmm. we've got this with the, we don't know what cell it infects, and in fact, some other people have had some other ideas about that. Perhaps they should have a garden conference on norovirus and <laughs> bring them up to date. Yeah, Rich, what were you going to say? The uh, sort of the long view on this, the long historical view on this is that, so this is a virus that causes gastroenteritis, and you might naively suspect that such a virus would obviously infect the epithelial cells, the the skin cells, basically, that line the gut, mm-hmm. all right? and make a lot of virus and cause a lot of pathology and result in diarrhea. And yet, uh, if you look in uh, humans at the uh, in any way you can, in particular the pathology and look for virus, under normal circumstances, uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, damage to the epithelium in the gut, and it's really hard to get any evidence that epithelial cells are infected by the virus. And so... Uh, many labs have used uh, both human studies and studies with the mouse norovirus to try and figure out what the uh, 
uh, uh, actual target of the infection is. And there seem to be kind of two camps, one of which says it'll be some sort of uh, not very abundant epithelial cell, and another of which there's a, a, a great body of evidence now that says that immune cells of one sort or another, uh, in particular B cells, uh, are a target. And there's also, in both camps, there's evidence that uh, the intestinal flora uh, plays a role uh, mm. in these infections. Mm. Right. So this is another paper in this attempt to pin down what the real target of infection is. I should say that despite 100 years of research on poliovirus, we still do not know where it replicates in the intestine. Hmm, and we probably right? will not because we have to stop. Because now it's got, all got to stop. <laughs> Soon we will have to stop. Yeah, we do not know. Even in the heyday, when many people were working on it, Sabin and Salk and all those people, Bodian, they never could precisely figure out what cell. If you could do one experiment and now, And guess what? Vincent. In a transgenic mouse, it doesn't replicate at all in the gut. <laughs> So you can't even use that to get some information on it. What were you going to say? Uh, no, I was just going to ask if you could design one experiment now using all the modern technology that wasn't available then. Could you answer that question by maybe green fluorescent protein tagging onto the genome or something? Well, what I would do is uh, you could do two things. Either make organoids, gut organoids, mm, right? Good idea. Or try and make slices of intestine and see if you could get an idea from that. I'm not sure they work so well, but you could, since we do that now with brains. Maybe they replicate in tough cells. That is a good question. And what I'm going to do is look for the expression of the poliovirus receptor in tough cells, because that's how they honed in on tough cells in this paper. So they, they're using oh. mouse neuromyris in mice, and they know that the receptor was CD300LF, which we talked about here on TWIV you know, a couple of years ago. It's a proteinaceous receptor, immunoglobulin superfamily member, very much like polio. So they said, we use this to find the target cell. So what they did was, uh, well, first they did some cool transplant experiments, bone marrow transplants. And this really got them on this road to saying it's not an immune cell. It seems to be something else. Right. So they're performing bone marrow transplants between mice lacking CD300LF so they had make knockout mice and wild type litter mates, and then they they infect them. So when you do a bone marrow transplant, you irradiate the mice intensely to knock out all their bone marrow, right? So the you kill all their immune mice. cells. You kill a lot of other cells mice. too. Though. Yes, the recipient mice, same as you would do in people who are getting a bone marrow. You not you irradiate them, and then you give them a transplant. You you might also uh, treat them with a chemical, but in any case you're knocking out the actively dividing cells. Right. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that this would eliminate the immune cells that they're trying to ask, does it infect? And they, I want to avoid this if I can. Yeah, yeah. this has a very high fatality rate associated with it, and it costs a lot of money also. However, in this, now in this paper, they're using a, a strain called CR6, where, you know, you feed it to mice, you get a lot of... Uh, Transmission, you get persistent infection. And so this is, a, this, is a, this is an important point, is that yes. this is a, it is, uh, it is not your standard wild-type strain of virus. It establishes a persistent infection uh, and is transmitted, which is, makes it easy to work with in this circumstance. Uh, but the wild-type strain cause, and, and you see in the, uh, the sort of the time course they do here, uh, in one of these figures, uh, you, you establish persistence within about three days, and that goes on for at least uh, three weeks. With a wild-type strain in mice, you establish an acute infection within one day, and then it clears. Hmm. So we're looking at a And to uh, be clear, in both these cases, a, we're talking about murine norovirus. Yes, we're talking about murine norovirus. Um, uh, but in, in the same way, in humans— the acute infection uh, spikes early and right. uh, clears relatively early. Uh, the the wild type Muri norovirus model is is a pretty good model for the humans. the The point is that this is uh, it can be argued that this is a special circum circumstance in the uh, Muri norovirus uh, 
literature, okay, with this uh, persistent virus. All right, bone marrow transplants. Take wild-type mice and you give them wild-type bone marrow. They remain susceptible to infection. Okay, no surprises there, right? You take the receptor knockout mice, you give them bone marrow from a receptor knockout mouse, resistant to infection. No surprises there. <clears throat> However, if you take a wild-type mouse and give them knockout mouse, receptor knockout mouse bone marrow, they are susceptible to infection. If you give knockout mice wild-type bone marrow, they're resistant to infection. Cool experiment. Yes. Very so cool it, experiment. So to summarize it, it doesn't matter whether they give the bone marrow immune cells from the wild type or the receptor mutant mice. It only matters what the recipient what mice the recipient are. Is. If, the, if the recipient it doesn't have the receptor, then it's resistant to the CR6 virus. Mm-hmm. Which, and this yeah. speaks, to the, speaks to the question of whether it's uh, immune cells or other cells that are the target of infection. This would argue, since immune cells come from the bone marrow, this would argue that in this particular infection, uh, the immune cells are not the primary target. Well, they, they are not. More, more generally, it argues that um, the primary target cells are not killed by irradiation. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Radi- yes. Radiation Good. resistant cells are responsible for infection which implies a non-dividing cell right yeah it's probably not bone marrow right yeah. right now this infection by the way is mostly distal small intestine and colon and you don't find infection in the spleen not much spleen replication okay all right so let's proceed with this what this radiation resistant, they, they say it must be an epithelial cell. And uh, they say, well, the receptor is thought to be on other t- cell types and not epithelial cells. So let's look in, the, uh, mm. in, un, in uninfected mice by immunofluorescence and see if we can find some CD300LF producing cells. Oh, by the way, Kathy, mm-hmm. I got Jane to agree to use expression. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah. In the next wow. edition. Wow. And I also probably got, haven't gotten her to cut out as many as is. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on it a little bit at a time because we also got her to agree to change all the nomenclature because, you know, we use little low let, small case yeah. letters and everyone yeah. hates it. And I said, we yeah. have to change it. Yeah. Because, you know, interfere on IFN is usually caps and, and we had it capital I, little F. Little. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's going to be all PKR. caps. It's all going to oh, be caps. Uh, okay. okay. So I'm working Good. on it. So um, CD300LF in, and they looked and they saw these amphora like cells uh-huh. and not many of them. And they said they must be tuft cells. Enough. Gee, that would be what I would say right <laughs> away, right? Well, yeah, of course they're tuft you cells. Know. If you say that it just rolls off your tongue, this would have a certain um, resonance here because this cell has taste receptors. Which is a rare chemosensory epithelia in the hollow organs. Exactly right. Hollow organs. So it's not just gut, right? No, it's respiratory tract, oral cavity. Show me your tough cells. No. (laughs) (laughs) Don't show that to anybody. Open wide. uh (laughs) They contain a long apical tuft of microvilli. They do. And they are the primary source of IL-25. Yes. Remember this. That's a type 2. That's a cytokine that initiates a type 2 response yeah, right. upon infection with intestinal helminths or here, here. parasites. So we have, have a, a we had a twip response. on this one. Yeah, what's a type 2 response? Type 2 response is antibody-based responses and uh, IgE. So now we have a convergence of quiv and twip, right? Yeah, we do. Life is intermeshed together. I and by to the way, I, um, we might have mentioned, I think this science paper is open access. Good. Good job. Gee. They paid for that. I, st- I was about to log in, and then I let me download it. So, Huh. Great. So they find that these tuft cells that have CD300LF, they also have a marker called double cortin-like kinase 1, DL- DCLK1, and cytokeratin 18, which come up later, which is why. I mentioned that, but I like double cortin. 
a nice name. It rings a bell. I don't know why. Um, they've, they've confirmed that these tough cells have RNA in them, and they uh, have a mouse line, a mouse line, a transgenic mouse line, where they have GFP introduced in a way that it's produced specifically in tough cells. Isn't that great? It's very yeah. good. I like it. I like it. I like it. So like you can it. look and you can see where CD300, oh, it's perfectly aligned with the GFP from the tough cell. <laughs> yes. So cool. It's nice to have such reagents. Isn't it? Uh, I'm very jealous. I mean, <laughs> so they find these in the ileum and the colon, and they are distinct in their expression of the CD300LF. Wow. Isn't that cool how the receptor yeah. is honing you in onto this? It is. So does norovirus infect tuft cells? Right. So they feed mice norovirus, and they can see, they, they stain the sections with antibody to a viral non-structural protein, and they can see uh, cells there in contacting the lumen that are infected uh, in both the villi and the crypts of the ileum. And they those cells also produce DCLK1, double cortin, et cetera, et cetera. Got it? <laughs> right? And other cells are not viral. I thought of it positive. as double click one. Double click. <laughs> Let me to click on this. Now, so so these appear to be the only cells infected, right? And so there, I'm I'm puzzled with the B cell re- result. Oh, of the previous, okay, right? so yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, uh, Rich has pasted in his uh, conversation with Stephanie about it, and I pasted in mine my conversation with Christiana about it. So this particular virus. So, so unlike CRC- norovirologists, you actually called other norovirologists. <laughs> <laughs> the, the CR6 strain causes a persistent infection and it antagonizes interferon lambda. And that allows it to set up shop in tuft cells, but other strains, the ones that cause those more lytic infections that Rich talked about, um, don't antagonize interferon lambda, and so they don't establish an infection in the tough cells, and they don't persist. And so the cell types that are infected during an acute infection by this particular CR6 strain or other persistent strains is not really known. And Stephanie had a uh, Stephanie Karst had an RNA scope tropism paper, which I think might be this one I linked to, um, that it you know, again, refers to the B cells, but also shows that T cells are infected. And then um, I can go on uh, with what Rich pasted in from Stephanie. Um, She wishes they would have looked at tropism at an acute time point. Uh, The ones that reach peak titers by day one infection may be the ones that are infecting or seem to be the ones that are infecting immune cells and are the primary target at this acute time point at least with MNV1 strain of mouse norovirus. And so maybe the persistent CR6 virus strain does infect immune cells early on, and then that's cleared, leaving only the tuft cells persistently infected. Mm. Or maybe there's an inherent difference in tropism between acute and persistent strains. Okay. Let's do, let's do this Nature Microbiology paper. It's the RNA scope paper. Okay. Because um, okay. I... I uh, do I do it right now? I... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, we need a little time to read it. I, as I recall, I think uh, Stephanie was just starting to work on this uh, as as I was leaving. And I may have caught up with her uh, a year or so ago when I was back there. But as I recall, it's it, it's actually tough to find the <laughs> yeah. um, immune cells uh, that mm-hmm. are, are infected. And the the sample preparation has to be done in a particular way, and the RNA scope and some other elements of the of the preparation uh, make it possible. But uh, that'll be an interesting contrast to this paper. We could do that. That's a great title. It's tough to find the immune cells. <laughs> <laughs> okay, those are all reasonable explanations for this difference. So that that's great. No, now, the, it's not like anybody's wrong. No, no. I'm just. Okay. I wanted to know because if you just read the paper and having read the B cell. Then you say, hey, well, nobody yeah, talks. Right. You know, yeah. they, they certainly I, don't discuss it here. Of course, that's probably science telling them they don't have room to have any discussion, yeah. right? Right. right. The other thing that they say now, these f- similar findings, tropism, were found in germ-free mice, indicating that intestinal bacteria are not required for either production of the receptor or infection. So again, I think, wow, 
you know, the previous studies have shown that bacteria are required for infection. But right. again, these same reasons may apply. However, right. they may they, not be required for the persistent. Yes, but they do. They do say something later that I think may contradict this. So keep that little uh, mm -hmm. germ-free thing in your head, and we'll come back to it. All right. So then they do flow cytometry of colonic epithelial cells from these infected GFP mice. Um, and they, this is great. They can count the number of tuft cells. They can find 128 plus or minus 33 infected tuft cells per million live epithelial cells. Wow. <laughs> That's not a lot. It's needles no. and haystacks. Needles and haystacks. Needles and tuft stacks, tufts right. and needle stacks, haystacks. So they were able to, to count those. And they say together, this tells us that tuft cells are the physiologic target cell of murine norovirus in wild type animals. But based on what Kathy and Rich have just conveyed from Stephanie and Christian, I don't think that's a fair statement to make, right? It depends yeah. on the virus that you're using and when you're catching it and so forth in our particular system. Okay. Um, and these are isolated cells, aren't they? It says that we didn't find clusters right. because they're pretty isolated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. So epithelium sloughs every seventh day. Mm -hmm. It starts in the crypt, <laughs> takes seven days, sloughs at the tip. I wonder what happens to tough cells. You think they slough? No, I don't think they slough. I don't, no? I don't think they slough. Hmm. Do you think the virus, oh, does the virus uh, kill them? That's another good question. I think they mentioned that. The CPE. Why would there be so much diarrhea associated with just that cell being infected? Well, there's not mm. necessarily you're not diarrhea. A, you're deregulating the G protein. Yeah, these mice don't get diarrhea, right? That's the yeah. That, that's diarrhea. another we point. We do. This we is, do. So we're, yeah. are our tough cells infected? I don't know, don't right? Know. Don't you know. could look. You could do a biopsy of people. Could, with, yes. With I'm sure it's been done. Autopsy. Huh? Well, they don't have neuroinfection at death, do they? I don't know. Maybe it caused their death, right? I, this is one of the problems with studying the the human model is right. that you know somebody who's just got diarrhea is not going to be not real anxious to uh, have a biopsy. No, right, that's true. How many, mm. by the way, uh, how much difference is there between the mouse model and the uh, human neurovirus? Uh, the acute models are really pretty close. No, uh, I mean, so there, there, there's the a lot of genes. You mean in terms a, of sequence. I can't do your chapter and verse, but you talk about you know, the there's virus? a lot of people yeah. who will. He wants will, to know about the virus. The I virus? Just, I just want to know how different the virus is between mice how and How different humans. is the sequence? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Okay. But mice do not get diarrhea. They don't no. vomit, right? You know what? That's interesting because there's a, a couple of other diseases that they don't get diarrhea from that we do also. And I'm blocking on that right now. But um, Mice? Yeah. Mm. As right. I recall, good models that, for that. The acute infection of mouse norovirus depends on the strain to some extent, uh, and the uh, both strain of mouse and the virus. But uh, you can uh, put together model systems of an acute norovirus infection where you can definitely see GI symptoms, and it winds up getting measured in terms of sort of what the stool looks like. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They I don't remember necessarily... Stephanie measuring water content yes, of the stool. That kind of stuff. Yeah. Right. All right, now let's talk about type 2 immunity and its relationship with norovirus infection. So IL-4 and 25 induce these tough cells to proliferate, huh. right? So they fed mice either one or phosphate-buffered saline, and then they give them norovirus. And They're giving them the cytokines and giving them the virus. Yeah. So these cells arise in the crypt. Are you saying that the cells that have already finished differentiating into tough cells, they now are stimulated to replicate above the crypt? Mm hmm That's correct. So that's an unusual feature. Why? Because the cells originate down at the bottom, and then they differentiate as they mm -hmm. move up, a, the mm. up the tree. According to this paper, it says it induces proliferation, hyperplasia. So that's fascinating. Anyway, when you feed mice IL-4 and IL-25 and you infect them, they're more likely to be infected, and it enhances uh, genome levels, genome copies, and it, it increases fecal shedding. At 21 days after infection, then they, they injected IL-4, and it, at that point, it also increased fecal shedding. Hmm. It increased shedding in mice that uh, lack RAG1, which means they have no B or T cells, I believe. So no adaptive response. Um, 
that they still increase uh, shedding with the with the IL four. Also, interferon lambda receptor mice still works with them. Hmm. So, in other words, the cytokines are not affecting T or B cells, and it doesn't. It's not. A, it's independent of interferon lambda. Mm-hmm. And now we get to trichinella spiralis. What? What is that coming from? <laughs> and this uh, infection apparently induces type two inflammation and has been shown previously to augment norovirus infection with this CR6 strain. <laughs> and that's science in 2014. Trichinella can infect any mammal. So that's you can use that as a co-infection. I'm surprised that we missed this paper. Did we did, anyone we, look at it, we, by the way? You might have missed the paper, but we didn't miss the connection between trichinella and tough cells because I, I know we talked about that in one of the we clips. Did. So, yeah. Dixon, you can feed mice uh, trichinella. It That's will. all I did for most of my life. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not done with my question. I'm not done with my question. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry. And you feed them which form? You feed them the infective larva, larva, and which is in the happens? muscle cells. Goes into their colon? It goes, no, they don't infect the colon at all. They infect the small intestine only. Ah, so oh, this at least replicates in the distal ileum, so that's yeah, covered there. That's okay, right, that's right. So, again, the previous paper showed that trick induces type two inflammation and also increases neuroinfection, and they suggested it had to do with uh, replication in macrophages. And so these guys say, well, we don't see anything in macrophages, so let's see if. Um, the the effect of the IL four treatment has is, is a consequence of interaction with epithelial cells, so they make a mouse a knockout mouse <laughs> lacking the epithelial cell specific IL four receptor, <laughs> conditional knockout mice so you can induce the knockout, mm-hmm. and they infect these mice they give them IL four, the IL four enhances replication in. Um, control animals, but not the knockouts. So the IL-4 is signaling on, recept- on epithelial cells. So the the uh, tough cells are epithelial cells, they right? Are. So that's, what's, right. that's how are. it's working. It's not in a macrophage, right. as previously suggested by the T. spiralis. Are you excited about this T. spiralis virus connection? Yeah. I'm- so this would mean that if you had trichinella and norovirus, you might have a worse norovirus infection. <laughs> You're having a very, very bad. You're yeah. having a bad they day. They served a <laughs> steak tartare that wasn't steak tartare on board ship. I think if you have trichinella <laughs> and norovirus, that is a one star review. Now right. that's a you know that's a double hit. That's that's so unlucky. Joe Blitzfitz might have gotten it, but not everybody else. <laughs> but there still is trichinella now and then, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Remember, we talked about that. Especially in Asia. A lot of it in Asia, right? Mm-hmm. Now. Yeah, that's right. All right. Now, to the microbiome. Uh-huh. So they say, previous work has shown that the bacterial microbiome is needed for efficient norovirus infection. CR6, with the CR6 strain, which is being used here. Uh-huh. And they say, in, in that previous paper, which we did here, you treat mice with antibiotics to deplete bacteria in the intestine. You don't get a good infection. So they said, if we treat mice with antibiotics, is that going to affect tuft cells? And they uh, they actually look at R- do RNA-seq on uh, mice to look at the difference in tuft cell gene expression in antibiotic and untreated mice. And they see there is an effect uh, of antibiotic treatment. Mm. It decrease antibiotics decrease these markers of tuft cells, DCLK1, in the colon, but not in the ileum. It gets complicated. Very IL4 and IL25 induce tuft cell proliferation in the ilia of antibiotic treated mice, but not in the colon. <laughs> So type 2 cytokines and bacteria regulate tough cells, but they do so in a tissue-specific manner. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, let's see, let's finish this. They do some infections here. So then they said, could the antiviral role of antibiotics, you give antibiotics to mice, it cuts down neurovirus infection. Could this be overcome by giving them type 2 cytokines? So what they do is they take mice and they treat, treat them with antibiotics challenge them with norovirus, you know, that reduces infection. If you give them IL-4 or IL-25, it increases the replication, which right. was previously shut, pushed down by antibiotic treatment. So they, they're saying the antibiotic treatment is affecting the tough cells, and that is what is reducing the virus replication. 
Okay, so that's fine. But why in the, earlier in the paper they said germ-free mice don't matter? Infection of, of tough cells doesn't matter in germ-free versus wild-type mice. But here they're saying it makes a difference. Does anyone have a, an I, answer to that? that? No, I can't answer that. I don't know what I don't I couldn't tell whether they were arguing that the antibiotics are directly affecting the tough cells or, yeah, or what I consider yeah. more likely that the antibiotic treatment is wiping out the gut bacteria which is affecting the tough cells because one of the functions of the tough cells is to sense the intestinal environment mm. and right. presumably sense the microbiome as part of that. So if there's yeah. no microbiome, then I would expect those cells to be kind of twiddling their thumbs. Uh, yeah, well, so maybe if you're uh, raised germ-free and not slammed with antibiotics all of a sudden, the tough cells make some sort of an adjustment. Maybe. It could right. be. Yeah, okay. That would make sense. <clears throat> yeah. It would be nice if they had mentioned that. But I'll blame, well, I'll blame it, science. They say we're at the end of page five, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So mm. I think what we can say from this paper is that tough cells can be infected by this CR6 strain of norovirus, right? And um, they express the receptor. They're rare in the intestine. They are, they, their number is regulated by these IL-4 and IL-25, um, which can make more of them and infect uh, norovirus yields. And so now the question is, well, one of my main ones is what's happening in people, which we or right. taught one is is a tough cell in humans the site of replication. I guess you could do, do if you make an organoid. Do they have tough cells in it? Well, I was you know, take it. <laughs> one of one of the culture systems that's been explored and where they've gotten a little bit of apparent mm -hmm. replication in vitro is an organoid uh, system. And as I recall, it's a fairly it's a, a a fiddly thing to do, and not a large percentage of the cells. Uh, are infected, and so it would be interesting to investigate that and see what kind of cells in the organoids are actually being infected and yielding virus. So there's a summary here at the end of the article written by someone at Science, and it says, um, these effects may explain the associated persistent disease symptoms that humans can suffer. And I would say no, because we don't even right. know if tough cells are infected in humans, right? Right, correct. So I didn't see that. That was written in a, in Science, not in Nature. Where yeah, at the end of the uh, Science or, article, you know, it keeps going. No, this is Science. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, okay. keeps going on. There's a an extra page with all links, and it says aiding and abetting norovirus right. disease, and that's where it's written. That's ah. their little one paragraph uh, sort of right. press release type thing. Got it. I think we're going to hear more about tough cells as. Uh, well, it was actually, it one thing, one they, thing they mentioned at the end, thank you for reminding me, is that maybe other viruses infect tough cells. Hey, maybe right. polio infects tough cells. Maybe it does. Never going to know because mice are not orally infectable. Although if you do take away the interferon type 1 receptor, you can get mouse gut infection. So maybe it's worth looking at. So it. even after this study is finished now, in summary, do we know what the receptor is in mice for this strain of norovirus? Yeah, it's CL300. Yeah, we, yeah. we know exactly. So isn't there a way to interfere with that and not get an infection by using that? In people? No, 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 in mice. Yeah, sure. That's no problem. So I that's, mean, you've they've got the organoids in mouse. You can just saturate it with the protein, but not the virus, and then it would not go in by competitive inhibition. Correct. Well, yeah, uh, that's the uh, ultimate uh, proof. Yeah, you could probably titrate the receptor. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking. I just uh, want to know if organoids have tough cells. It depends on where you take them from. Oh, look, tough cells. Uh, organoids have tough cells. Let's see. Let's see. Um, here's a paper: the intestinal epithelium tough cell. Let's see, organoid. Organoid. I mean, if you took them from the jejunum rather than the ileum, you wouldn't get them. Hey, tough cells originate from crypt cells, which was recently confirmed in organoids. So okay. organoids have tough cells. So you could make a human intestinal organoid. It's the same paper that you got your picture from, Dixon. Okay. All right. That's a 2012 publication. Yeah, it's uh, the intestinal epithelium tough cell specification and function. So you could make human organoids and make sure they have tough cells using these markers, you know, double cortin and then um, see if they can be infected. I'm so curious about the <laughs> cell type, though. Where does the, res where does the neurologic connection go 
from a tough cell. What is it? Are they the up? ones that are innervated? Yeah, they've got they've got your receptors for taste. No, oh, that's yucky. <laughs> I know exactly right. <laughs> I don't taste what's in my intestine. I know that's the point. Chemo well, sensor, you, chemo how does it get in your intestine? Then? So then, does, <laughs> does it go? Because there is a serotonergic nervous system there. Yeah, yeah, of course. Our friend here you worked uh, on it for years. Michael Gershon. Michael Gershon that's, that's yeah, that's correct. So it, it's it's a, it's such a curious system. It's curious. It's a second and brain. Curious. Second brain. Something. They called it the second brain. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That. So curiouser yeah. and curiouser. very very curious. Kathy, are you uh, are, are you? Finished with the paper. You have any other comments? I have no other comments, okay. but I agree with Rich. It would be nice to do that other paper another yeah, time. We'll do it in, in, in a little bit. We'll get a break from Noro. Yeah. Kathy, can you take <laughs> the first email? Sure. Jimmy writes Hi, guys. I'm a frequent Swedish listener who has some questions about the Pu. P-U-U-V virus, which is Pumala virus. In 2008, I was lucky to get hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome caused by P-U-U-V virus. Actually, that's redundant. P-U-U-V. Yeah. <laughs> Large outbreak between 2007 and 2008 due to peak in the vol cycle. So he was being sarcastic when he was saying he was lucky to get this. Well, why he addressed himself as lucky is because uh, he had done his master's thesis in zoonoses, Borrelia burgdorferi, mm -hmm. and he felt great about having gotten that. He's also tried uh, Borreliosis, but that was not nearly as painful as his light hemorrhagic fever from PUUV. In Sweden, the PUUV only persists in the northern regions, and about 50 to 2,000 cases are reported yearly. The reservoir of the virus here in Sweden is bank voles, myotis, gliriolis. Anyway, he has two questions. Could you dedicate some time to explain the micro and molecular biology and pathogenesis of these viruses and maybe the Swedish variant, which humoristically is called the Northland Ebola? <laughs> <laughs> and two, do you know any post-disease symptoms, uh, for instance, years after the infection? So he uh, got this in 2008, which was when there was a major outbreak. And from what I could see, maybe the last major outbreak. Um, so to answer the second question first, I tried looking for sequelae and uh, I wrote to Stuart Nickel, but Stuart's out of the office. Um, mm. I did find uh, one paper that talked about severe kidney damage um, and that being in the forest is a risk factor for severe kidney damage, which I found <laughs> very confusing because I would think being in the forest is a risk factor for getting infected, getting infected from, yes. from the bank voles, but whatever. Um, and a couple of papers did find that uh, smoking is a risk factor for severe mm. kidney disease, but this paper found uh, that I found did not uh, say that that was the case. But in terms of long-term sequelae, um, I don't know, maybe a predilection for kidney damage, but Maybe we'll eventually hear from Stuart about that. Hmm. And this and, Pumala virus is a it's a hantavirus. It is right. That was mentioned yet. Right, it's a hantavirus, which is a uh, negative strand RNA virus. Negative strand with Another three, rodent. Three genome virus. segments. Three genome segments. At it's least in an, mammals, it's enveloped. <laughs> yes, maybe in a, in a uh, Lancelot, Lancelot. <laughs> <laughs> Sir Lancelot. <laughs> Sorry, I prefer two. the New England Journal of Metalist. Four. <laughs> Maybe it had four in the uh, neocordates, or uh, yeah. ones no, without a no, backbone. No, no, no that's right. Um, envelope viruses. So, Dixon, because the genome is negative stranded, yes. what is it coated with in the virus particle? It's <laughs> coated with mucus? Oh, what is it coated with? Coated. I thought you asked me what it was coated no, with. No, no. <laughs> really, what is it coated with? Coated with. Yeah. It's got a capsid, right? It's got a nucleocapsid. Okay, it's, it's got a nucleocapsid. Proteins, proteins. Yes. Okay, proteins. There are three segments, M, L, and S. Yep. Large, and, medium, and small. Yeah. That's it. Negative, <laughs> negative <laughs> sense genome. A lot of these break down that way, Kathy. Can you name another hantavirus? Uh, hantavirus. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But give me a more interesting name. A more interesting Four Corners. Name. Four Corners. Yeah. Well, th that's that not one? the that's not the right name anymore. They didn't oh, wait, yeah. Right. Isn't it the <laughs> Sinombre? Sinombre. Yeah, the no Sinombre. Name. Sinombre. I was going to say right. Sinbis, but then, no, no. They, they ultimately decided not to give it a name. Yeah. Right. Rodent reservoirs transmitted by rodent urine and feces. Yeah. And there is a drug that you could use. It's experimental, but it's a really interesting drug 
which we just talked about in my course. It's called favipiravir. It's a nucleoside analog that inhibits a wide range of DNA and RNA polymerases. So it will inhibit many DNA and RNA viruses, and this is one that they've tested. So um, if, you know, it's not licensed, but... Is this a competitive inhibition where it gets into the active site and prevents? No, it's a chain terminator. A chain terminator. So it does get in the active site. It's incorporated into the growing chain. Oh, I see. And that, so chain is probably puzzling for people who don't know science, right? <laughs> Caleb is <laughs> listening. Is, is that the wind sock that Rich Condit right. was talking about? Yeah. It's the Texas chain. That's a good thing Rich didn't say something. Because it's a, term, a chain terminator. There aren't a lot of um, PUUV infections, right? Yeah, fifty to two thousand cases a year. Yeah, I think. Oh, this, was that just in Sweden? I don't know. Yeah, I, I think so. I want maybe. to go back to the other figure: two hundred thousand deaths of from nor- oh, norovirus. Yeah, two hundred thousand. It's what it said in the paper. It's an yeah. enormous number. Well, they global, wouldn't print it if it wasn't true. That's There's still seven a billion people in the no, world. No, that's still a big number. Yeah, two hundred two hundred thousand people. <laughs> Too many. Mostly kids. Well, I think in countries that don't have fluid replacement, right? That's yeah, it. It, it, yeah. it has how does that developed. how does that compare to rotavirus? Rota is is worse. Worse. Yeah. What was worse? Was well, worse. before before Probably that still vaccine. is globally. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because there's a there's a, we've now got a a vaccine for rotavirus. Uh, rotavirus used to be two hundred thousand the the dominant That's incredible uh, uh, creature in uh, gastro. Right, uh, gastroenteritis, right. but with the vaccine, norovirus has come to dominate. So, so according to WHO, the estimated rotavirus deaths for children under five in 2013 was 215,000. That's incredible. So that is also, but that's only young kids. Although right. I think as you get older, you probably have less chance of dying. Man, getting back, uh, yeah, because uh, you made it through the first time. Getting back, uh, to, I think you get a durable immunity yeah. with rotavirus, and norovirus doesn't do that. Uh, Pumala virus. Less than half a percent of the cases are are lethal. So that's good. So it's not really an Ebola of the north. <laughs> right. Right. Um, in tw- this is interesting. In 2014, an Israeli researcher studying bank voles in Finland died of Pumala virus infection, which caused a complete breakdown of her immune system. Lord. And I would tell you more, but the article is in <laughs> Hebrew. Or no, that's not the right language, right? Israeli. Yeah. Hebrew. It's Hebrew, isn't it? Oh yeah, I was thinking of Yiddish. Right. It's no. Hebrew. No, I don't yeah. think anybody writes scientific articles <laughs> no, in Yiddish. They don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> Dixon, uh there is yes. a mail from Mark. Can you read that? Mark Wait, writes. do do Pumas get Pumala virus? Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Good title if we ever did a Pum- that's Pumala right. virus that's episode. All right, here we go. <laughs> Mark writes, my master's student daughter was assigned to listen to TWIV. Awesome. That's great. As the great father that I am, ahem, cough, I have made her aware of TWIV, TWIM, and TWIP since I started listening several years ago. She sent a text to me saying, quotes, I chose number 356, gut viriome, in my children who are malnourished. No, in children who are malnourished. Trying to sound half as smart as my daughter, Wiki, and I wrote back, quotes, as opposed to virome, which more commonly refers to a collection of nucleic acids contained by viruses in a microbiome, she texted her response, quotes, oh, typo on my part. That was not my point, but now I have to ask, did you use virome when you should have used virome? She thinks you have it right, but I think that was a quick way to say, I don't really care, Dad, <laughs> versus trying to find the answer. I think you got it wrong. <laughs> what do you say, Mike? Longtime listener, you often put me to sleep at night. Now, that's, I'm not sure that's a compliment. No, but, it's not. Um, so, what is the correct? Virome. Virome, not virio. No. And did, did you ever have a typo of virio? No, no. In the no. show notes or anything? No. So I she just, said it was a typo on her part. On her part, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. she took the mea culpa route and he yeah. didn't quite accept no, that. No, we, we, yeah. Of all the things, I do make typos, but virome wouldn't be one of them. No. Although I could. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? No, it's That's virome. right. Hopefully, this, uh, this episode will keep you up, though, Mike, because we've quoted your letter. Right. <laughs> 
Richard sends us a link to an Howard Hughes article, New Microscope Captures Detailed 3D oh, yeah. Movies of Cells Deep Within Living Systems. It's a zebrafish, I think, right? You've seen this? Yeah, zebrafish in yeah, yeah, ear. Yeah. yeah, I got, I got, I'm, I'm hooked on microscopy. I love it. And uh, it's really made a lot of advances recently. So you the latest see, issue of Science has a nice. You can see these in a living animal. Yeah, yeah they're all fluorescently labeled in different ways, cool. and they're, it's a fantastic. It looks look it looks like a star chart. Look at the spinal cord. It's gorgeous. Yep. Yeah, this is just going to get better. Correct. It's very cool. Tom Kirchhausen is on this paper, which was published just this month in. Um, Science, observing the cell in its native yeah, state, yeah. imaging subcellular dynamics in multicellular organisms. So subcellular I've heard, dynamics. I've heard about some of this before. He's shown some movies. Uh, I'm on a committee that yeah, he's part of, and it's pretty cool. It is. Uh, Alan, would you like to take the last email? Sure. <laughs> Anthony writes, Twiv Weather Report, an ancient tradition, <laughs> and sends a link. Um, and this is a, uh, it's a Google Books it's the references to a book um, called Ancient Meteorology. <laughs> and there's a footnote in here um, from, let's see, Simplicius, 1980. Uh, Meteorologia is a highly dubious, uh, okay, he notes, Diogenes may have been a medical practitioner. This may have spurred his interest in meteorology. Well, the connection between medicine and meteorology is a topic outside the scope of this work. Nevertheless, it's worth mentioning several Hippocratic medical treatises in this context and uh, talks about um, comments on weather conditions uh, relevant to epidemics in these ancient <laughs> texts. Oh, That's yeah. Oh. The author claims it is not only possible to predict diseases from the weather— but also to predict <laughs> weather from diseases, <laughs> yes. So that's why we well, talk about the weather right here. Right. right. Yeah. Sometimes go. it might seem that the meteorologists are just predicting weather from diseases. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hmm. All right. That's it for our email. Is kind that of, really? We're caught up on email? Well, there's a few others suggesting papers for us to do, but we're okay. wow. That's right. caught That's up. Fantastic. We have some things that, you know, why don't you do this? And I'm thinking we might do it, so I'm right. just holding them back. But, yeah, pretty much um, – so I, I don't know. It's graduation time. Maybe people are busy. Yeah. Perhaps. Or maybe uh, people are tired of asking just, us questions that we never answer. We've just stopped, <laughs> we've stopped offending everyone. <laughs> oh, that's not going to happen. Let's do some picks. Yeah. Alan Dove, what do you have? I have a little YouTube, uh, about a three and a half minute video. Um, <laughs> this is someone giving a presentation at a, uh, I believe it's an oncology or pathology conference. Um, guy standing at a podium. And he's talking about oligodendroglioma, which is a, um, uh, a brain cancer, basically. Um, and, uh, oh, yeah, so this was at the, at the American Association of Pathology Assistance meeting in San Francisco in 2011. Um, and he gives the intro to his presentation to the tune of Ave Maria. <laughs> Usually not a humorous subject, by the way, I must Normal, say. No, not a humorous subject, but he, he sings it beautifully. Yeah, he does. Singer. He sings it beautifully. It, yeah. I think the arm bone song is a more humorous subject. Yes. Uh, ground. Which kind is totally intended. <laughs> so on the 25th of April was published yes. the latest update of the Gaia star map. Yeah, 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 yeah. And for those who are not into this, Gaia is a European space agency project where in 2013, they launched a satellite that occupies a, um, what do they call it? Uh, uh, dang, I'm losing it now. The I'll get it, I'll get it because I got it right geosynchronous? here. Geosynchronous? Yeah, it's not, no, it's not, ge, it's not geosynchronous. Lang, uh, l uh, Larangian point, okay? That's a, it, it, they launched it to a place between the Earth and the Sun, oh yeah, it's a where the miles gravitational away. pull right, of the right. Earth and Sun balance each other out, so the thing just sits there, okay, right. and then rotates, uh, and it's constantly between on the line between the Earth and the Sun. So as the Earth goes around the Sun, this thing orbits the Sun as well, and among other things, that allows it <clears throat> to get a parallax view of the stars and triangulate distances. 
uh, and so also can, get can that look data. At, right. So you can look at something from one point and then look at the same angle from a very, very distant point in the opposite end of its orbit around the sun. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, it's like having two eyes set very, very far apart. <laughs> <laughs> very, very, <laughs> very far apart. <laughs> Uh, and this, uh, the technology aboard this thing is exceptionally robust and the latest map now that this thing has been up for five years, uh, gives precise measurement of nearly 1.7 billion stars. Right. Mm. Can you believe this? Yes. Revealing previously unseen details of our home galaxy. Uh, and this article that I, you know, I, this was, this has been echoing around various news media, but I went to something that looks like pretty much the source at the European Space Agency. And there's a lot of other links in the link that I'm giving here uh, to the Gaia project. But there are several images that you can look at and movies and stuff that show what's going on. It shows, like I said, distances, uh, brightness. Uh, movements of the various stars, and it's a much more detailed uh, picture of our own galaxy and uh, some extra galactic things as well, other galaxies that are moving around outside our own galaxy. So I thought that was pretty cool. It is. Mm. Richard, how many yeah. stars are there in our galaxy? I do not know. But there are 10 to the 78th atoms in our visible universe. There are. 10 to the 78th. Okay. That's a big number. Huge. It is. Very large. But it's not as big as all the possible combinations of four bases in a 10,000 base viral sequence. <laughs> <laughs> I know that because when I, I just gave my evolution lecture and mm. I show that as a way of showing how many different viruses there can be. Fascinating. Got Fascinating. <laughs> Dixon, what do you have for us? Well, I have, this, I picked this one for Alan because <laughs> I know that you are, you have your feet on the ground, but sometimes your head's in the clouds. And uh, this is a very unusual look at clouds. They have figured out a way of making three-dimensional images of various cloud formations. And I've never seen clouds look like this before. This is pretty cool. So when you fly next time through clouds, <laughs> Alan, and I know you do that occasionally. I don't know if you can I, I do that I, now. Yeah. You do that. Excellent. And then... I, it doesn't look like that, right? But somehow, when you do all these other manipulations, you know, you get these it doesn't images. look like that. But sometimes it feels like that. Yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet. It's one of the things that I discovered in in um, doing my instrument rating, and you're flying through the clouds. Of course, I've been through clouds in commercial airliners. Um, yeah, sure. And uh, and a couple of times when I was a kid, when I was flying with my stepfather, but I was too young to really process what was going on. <laughs> um, but when you see them coming at you head on, yeah. And you fly into them. Yeah, you right. you sense the presence of them because they're they're being produced by convection in many cases, and you feel the sudden convection, and <laughs> right. you realize why right. the cloud here. It's because right. the convection's right here, and that's the turbulence. Uh, so yeah, this is this is pretty cool. Good, I'm glad you like it. Yeah, I always enjoy when you're going through clouds on a plane. You start bumping around. Mm -hmm. Oh, it makes you I, realize that they're not as pretty as they look. <laughs> you know what I do when I'm in the clouds and I know we're going to land somewhere? <laughs> and I'm looking out the window. I usually get a window seat and I look down and I'm looking for the color change. And as soon as it gets darker, I know that we're almost through the clouds. Yeah. And it just is such a relief. But one time I flew to Germany. I flew to uh, Frankfurt on Mines. And you could see the, the steeple tops poking up through the mist. <laughs> and That's the cool. guy was going to divert to Stuttgart, and some guy in the back of the airplane said, you can't do that, we've got to land. I was on a Lufthansa flight, and the cap they landed the airplane. Captain couldn't have heard the guy yelling. No, I'm sure he didn't, but, <laughs> but he, he landed it. We had six feet of visibility before we hit the runway. Isn't that less than they usually? Much, you? much, you with much a, with less. Modern airliners at particular airports, you can do um, – a, a fully basically a fully automated approach mm -hmm. and they can land in zero zero conditions really and well they, that's why there's a there's a whole special training that's required for this and you crazy. have to have crazy special equipment on the plane and on wow. the ground to be able to do it but big airports are often equipped for this newark is equipped for it uh jfk um do they use and, it at all oh yeah yeah, they they will they will fly seven forty sevens. Well, not seven forty sevens, triple sevens, I guess now, and yeah. and all the you know planes of that type into these huge international <laughs> airports down into the fog. Um, but a big part of the training is um, lots and lots of simulations of the 
manifold ways in which this can fail. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Wonderful. So, you know, Correct. if it fails Correct. when you're 20 feet off the ground, what's the procedure? If it fails when you're 10 feet off the ground, what's the procedure? And <gasps> so on. Yeah. Well, uh, so, but usually they close the airport, so, you know, because yeah. there are other planes that can't land, right? Yeah, that's true. Hmm. So someday this, everything will be automated, right? Yeah. No? I don't know. Car- I, I really I really don't know. They talk about self-driving cars, and I'm not sold on that. Oh, and me, I've either, seen, me either. I've, I've seen what great. it takes to automate and, and get things to work in aviation, and it's just, <laughs> you know, it's tricky. The, you need a human supervising this stuff still. My son is a uh, tra- air traffic controller out in Wichita, and yeah. he continually laments the poor quality of the equipment that they have to use that dates back to the late 60s and early yeah. 70s if they conti- if they wanted to upgrade it they would have to shut down the entire <laughs> system for a week yes. install the new equipment and it, they can't do that so try, try and rebuild the interstate highway system without <laughs> traffic traffic <laughs> you're right it's not going to happen so, and and you have to replace it with things that are as robust so that's a big part of the problem. Alan what's the solution then because you got to replace it eventually don't you you do, but you can replace it with stuff that's pretty much the same. Like gradual. Regardless. Yeah. Right. Um, my mom was heavily involved with this. She worked for a company called Air Inc. And oh. uh, they oh. were in the process. They were one of the contractors doing exactly that, working on a system to update our air traffic control system. It's yeah. still a going project. And that is happening, but wow. it's very, very slow. What about the military? Do they have a better advantage because they can shut down stuff and... Uh, no, they're using the same stuff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they, they do have a few things that are different. I mean, they've got like arresting cables for carrier landings and that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, but they are, they are using the same technologies. Right. Kathy, what do you have? I picked this story, uh, from the material science realm. This is a story that I found because it's about a researcher at, uh, the University of Michigan in material science engineering named Anish Tuteja or Tuteya. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. But he's developed a smooth, durable, clear coating that uh, is repels pretty much everything. So they call it omniphobic uh, in material <laughs> science par- parlance. Wonderful. And so um, it's proposed that it could be used for phone screens, uh, countertops, camera oh, lenses. Nice. Uh, would uh, shed water, oils, alcohols, and even peanut butter because he has a two-year-old. And and so (laughs) this particular project was important for that. So there's a short little video. But the other thing I liked about this article is that while it had the scientific content, it was very digestible to someone outside the field. So I thought it was a good example of science communication. Good. It, it is mm-hmm. well written. Mm-hmm. And I've actually followed this group's work a little bit because um, they've done some stuff that would be uh, that's hydro- highly hydrophobic coatings that would be completely resistant to water and ice, mm. which would uh, not to pull the subject back to the aviation again, but it would be a huge deal in aviation. And this mm. omniphobic coating would be a huge deal. I mean, they're talking about what I consider fairly trivial things like phone screens. Mm. Um, but if you imagine putting this on the bottom of a ship, yeah, absolutely, so barnacles can't attach to it. Sure, that could be that could be big game, major. Now I don't yeah. know what this stuff costs per gallon. No, it's free. <laughs> All right, it's free. <laughs> right? Don't you know but, it's free? You know why? Because grime doesn't pay. <laughs> uh, but they do talk about it as a way to uh, save energy. So, in some of the ways that you've alluded to, Alan. You know what we be perfect for is the uh, wind farms, because they have to clean those blades every now and then. They they accumulate mm-hmm. insects and stuff, and it slows them down, and they actually lose sure. efficiency. This would be absolutely perfect for that. So many things. Yes. So this, takes, things. this takes me back to the days before <laughs> Eppendorf tubes and Eppendorf pipettes, where when we were working with small quantities of RNA, we used to, the smallest tube you had was a 15 mil Corex tube. <laughs> Jeez. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. right. And we used, and we used to siliconize. <laughs> yeah. right. We used to siliconize them so that the uh, RNA would pellet in a nice little pellet. So a good siliconized tube had a, uh, was a thing of beauty. <laughs> that's Correct. that's a wow. quote. You're going to be quoted on the on Twitter. <laughs> Last week, go. someone quoted you as saying, the cat is a fomite. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the guy out there, uh, Ed Edward Grow, who uh, likes to quote you, Rich. Right. No, my cat's constantly scratching because he has fomites. Uh, okay. Yes. No. Yeah, it's good. It's no. great. I have a pick uh, from Lancet, which is uh, related to our listener picks. In part why I picked it. There's a little comment by Nicholas Grassley, who is in um, Imperial College London, is called Eradicating Polio with a Vaccine We Must Stop Using. I love it because many years ago, Alan and I wrote a opinion in science with this theme, we have to stop it. And everyone said we were crazy, blah, 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 right? And now everyone is, they're listening to us. Like Alan, thought. they're listening to they're, like they're not listening fox. to us. They just came to the same conclusion we told them they were going to come to. <laughs> yeah, so. of course. Anyway, this is interesting because it talks about how to withdraw oral polio vaccine while still completing eradication in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Nigeria, which are still endemic, has never been, circulation Syria. has never been stopped. Now, Syria is a different story. Okay. Syria, there we had stopped endemic polio, but now it's they're getting outbreaks of vaccine-derived polio viruses. In 2017, for the first time, more children were paralyzed by vaccine-derived polio viruses than wild type. There were 95 vaccine-derived cases versus 22 of wild polio. And Syria and DRC were the two countries. And Syria, of course, couldn't they couldn't immunize because of the conflicts. And these vaccine-derived viruses, which are derived from oral polio vaccine, Sabin vaccine, they circulate. So if you have populations where vaccine coverage drops, that's going to be an issue. And so this paper is all about, so these outbreaks in Syria and DRC were type 2 vaccine-derived polio, which derived from trivalent vaccine, which was used for a while, and then that was stopped. We switched to bivalent and got rid of the type 2, but then there are outbreaks because— And there are people susceptible to type 2. So then this article is all about using monovalent type 2 to, to quell those outbreaks. It works quite well, but then he says there is some hesitancy about the use of monovalent type 2 in large campaigns because of the risk of creating more vaccine-derived yes. viruses. And that's the crux of the issue. Is you, as long as you use those, it's a problem. Yeah. Um, and he says, though, in, in his um, opinion, the risk of ongoing vaccine-derived polio circulation clearly outweighs that of new emergencies after OPV2 use. So he thinks that we have to just deal with with it because we have to control outbreaks. But I say you have to make a better effort to switch to IPV yeah. and um, take care of this. So that's that's an interesting little comment. And, and that goes together with our listener pick, which comes from Stephen, who writes, Hey, Twivome, I wanted to submit this article from The Guardian for a pick of the week. The content isn't groundbreaking for Twiv, but I thought you'd appreciate the headline, and it gives Vincent and Alan and everyone else a chance to talk about the state of polio eradication, unless you've done that recently. I'm not currently caught up. And this is a Guardian article by Amitabh Bakchan. Forget the Avengers. It took real heroes to make India polio-free. So Amitabh is apparently a Bollywood star who is really into child health. Mm. And, you know, he writes... It was a time not long ago when eradicating polio from my country seemed like pure fiction. Not even 10 years ago, India was home to nearly half of the world's polio cases. So I felt pride on the day four years ago when we could finally announce the eradication of polio from India. And he, you know, his thing is we have a lot of uh, vaccine preventable diseases because of poverty and poor health systems and conflict. And he said, if we could get rid of this, you know, we can conquer diseases. And I appreciate his interest. And, you know, I'm thinking, we don't have much of that in this country. And people refuse to get vaccines. Certain people refuse to get vaccines when they could get. These people in these countries would love to have them. Because our movie stars are going around saying the opposite. Yeah. Some of them. All right. Thank you, Stephen. Thank and you. that is TWIV491. You can find it on any place where fine podcasts are are provided like your just get your podcast player on your phone do you have one on your phone dixon no no you don't listen to podcasts right I do. on your computer well anyway on your phone there are apps that you can listen to and you can subscribe no on my phone. 
you can <laughs> you have a phone app, you have a text, you have a mail app. Those are apps. We have um, apps, and you can just subscribe so you can get every episode. And we can. Um, <laughs> I like the fun fact. That's really good. That's excellent. Somebody's having a joke without letting the rest of us in on it. Kathy just texted us. Yes. Picture yeah. of the ASP president uh, tweet. New fun fact. The grandchildren of the archive committee chair, Rich Condit, know him as dude. Yeah, that's I, I've known that for a while. Yeah. <laughs> is that right, Rich? Yes. 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 It is right. Stacy was collecting fun <laughs> facts about uh, <laughs> ASV folks. So I just sent her that one. Good. Yep. They all call me dude. That's great. <laughs> send your questions and comments to twiv at microbe.tv. You can send your fun facts as well if you want. <clears throat> if you'd like to support us, you can give as little as $1 a month. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Helps us to uh, pay for the shows and move around, do some traveling. Maybe go visit some bank voles in Finland. Yeah. Be careful. <laughs> they could steal all your money. That's right. Oh, your life. <laughs> Dixon de Pommier is at Parasites without borders.com and trichinella.org. We yes. are reviving trichinella.org. We are. It's up and running right now. You could actually check it out and see what you But it needs oh. work. It needs work. We have it needs work, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's walking now. Before that, it was limping. Well, you couldn't even get into it because it had too much That's flash right. content. That's right. That's right. Were, its mu- were its muscles feeling stiff? They were. They were. <laughs> Thank you for that. Hey, Dixon. You're welcome. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Rich Condit. He's an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. He's on Twitter as Alan Dove. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Thanks to ASM for their support and Ronald Jenkins for his music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.